As I have said earlier, a different perspective can lend a magical clarity to an otherwise murky and doubtful business. Let me switch gears. This is a non sequitur. Uh, the Latin word phrase means something that does not logically follow from what preceded this, or at least it's an apparent non sequitur. A, apparently a digression, just to indulge myself, but humour me. The word dyadic corresponds to two choices, binary. Okay, so there's going to be a binary game being played here. Okay. Let me start with some very elementary fractional arithmetic. Of course, we go back to the middle school to understand this. Let's start with the number one half. Okay, now we all know exactly what this means. One is in the numerator, two is in the denominator, so this means exactly one times two to the power minus one. No problem. Let's try another fraction, let's say one quarter. One quarter means one in the numerator times two to the power minus two, which represents the denominator. Now, since we started with with a power of a negative power of two, let's build upon this by saying explicitly that I have zero times two to the power minus one plus one times two to the power minus two, and you will tell me, okay, so you've given me a long-winded description of one quarter, but bear with me. There is, of course, a method in the madness. Let's try another fraction. What about the fraction nine sixteenths? Well, nine sixteenths can be written as one half plus one sixteenth. Or another way of saying this is one half, no contribution from a quarter, no contribution from an eighth, and one sixteenth. Now we see here the beginnings of an incipient expansion of these numbers on the left in terms of reciprocal powers of two multiplied by zeros and ones. Now, to date, all the expansions I've shown you are finite. Right? Could we conceive of an infinite expansion in powers of two? But of course we could. For example, what if we summed reciprocal powers of even powers of two? For example, two to the power minus two, plus two to the power minus four, plus two to the power minus six, and so forth. Of course, you should write this down and stare at it. And what do you do? You'll see, ah, we recognize our old friend, the geometric series, yet again. And this entire sum sums to 2 to the power ne negative 2 in the numerator, and in the denominator, 1 minus 2 to the power negative 2. The numerator is 1 fourths, the denominator is 3 quarters, 1 quarters divided by 3 quarters, is one thirds, and we've discovered an infinite series expansion for one thirds. One thirds is exactly via the geometric series one quarter plus one sixteenth plus one sixty fourth plus dot 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 ad infinitum. In other words, one thirds is obtained by summing negative powers of even powers of two with no contribution from reciprocal odd powers of two. Here's an infinite expansion in negative powers of two for yet another number. Now, these expansions are beginning to look like the ordinary decimal expansions of numbers that we have grown to be fond of. For example, one half we write usually as 0.5. By this we mean, of course, that there's an implicit decimal base, a base 10 in the expansion. 0.5 means 5 times 10 to the power minus 1. Similarly, 1 quarter is 0.25. And by 0.25 we mean 2 times 10 to the power minus 1 plus 5 times 10 to the power minus 2. What I've now shown you is a similar expansion for numbers, but we have replaced the base. The base 10 has now been replaced by a base of 2, in which case the multiplying things will be either 0 or 1. 
And therefore, in a base 2 expansion, we could write one half more compactly as point 1 followed by an infinite string of zeros. All this means is that this means 1 times 2 to the power minus 1. 1 quarter is point 0, 0,1 followed by an infinite string of zeros. And what this means is 0 times 2 to the minus 1 plus 1 times 2 to the power minus 2 plus 0 times all the other negative powers of 2. Similarly, 9 sixteenths is point 0.1001 0, 0, 1, followed by an infinite string of zeros. These are all terminating expansions. 1 thirds turns out to be of the form point 0, 0,1001001 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 recurs indefinitely. Okay, and now you say, oh yes, this is just a different base representation for real numbers. And we scratch our heads and say, oh yes, we understand that we can represent a real number in any base we choose. And in particular, if we choose a real number x in the unit interval, x is between 0 and 1, then x can be represented in a dyadic expansion by an infinite expansion involving a binary digit 0 or 1 times 2 to the power minus 1. Naturally, we'll call the first binary digit x1 plus a binary digit 0 or 1 times 2 to the power minus 2. We'll call the next binary digit x2 and so on. And more compactly, we'll write this as a dyadic expansion as point, a decimal point, of course, in this case, is a binary decimal, followed by x1, x2, x3, x4, a string of zeros and ones. Oh, wait a minute. This sounds similar. This sounds like something which is triggering a memory. Didn't we have sequences x1, x2, x3, x4, and so forth, representing the outcomes of my conceptual coin toss experiment? Against all odds, we've discovered a pathway between that conceptual coin tossing experiment and an experiment where I give you an expansion for a real number. Now, this is a starting point for a very profitable and rich exploration. So what have we discovered so far? We've discovered that every real number in the unit interval can be represented by an expansion in binary digits. This is the dyadic expansion of the real number. And conversely, any such sequence of binary digits will result in a particular real number by going through the sum in the binary or the dyadic expansion. This is interesting. Not surprising because of our experience with ordinary decimal expansions. This is just a dyadic or binary expansion in base 2. But here's where things get interesting. This strikes a chord in memory. This reminds me of something. Where have I seen infinite sequences x1, x2, x3 before? Aha! Wasn't that what I call the outcomes of my chance experiment? These correspond to the idealized sample points of the experiment where I toss a coin repeatedly indefinitely.